of all of the Ten Commandments, the one that we will look at this morning is by far the most unique. No commandment raises more questions than this one. Don't get me wrong, all of the ten raise questions of interpretation, but there really isn't anybody saying that it is actually okay to turn a pound of silver or gold into an idol and worship it, right? Like, like nobody is saying that we should actually be murdering or committing adultery or that, that covetousness is actually acceptable. Nobody says that we are not bound by the commandment to honor our parents because Christ fulfilled the law. The other nine commandments, whatever questions of interpretation that we may have, we all recognize that we are morally bound to the commandment. That, that to break it, even in the new covenant, is sin. Yet, the fourth commandment is different. There are good, godly scholars and theologians and pastors and Sunday school teachers, and well-read men and women that say that we are morally bound to the fourth commandment. Then, there are other good, godly scholars and all the rest who say that in Christ the commandment has been fulfilled. Then there are others who say that we are bound to, uh, we are bound to the commandment, but simply attending corporate worship fulfills our obligations. There are those who say that we are to observe the commandment on the seventh day. And there are those who say we are to observe the commandment on the first day. I think, out of all of the commandments, none is more confusing than the fourth. And the noise of voices only serve to make it more confusing. So at the risk of adding yet another voice to the conversation. I'm, I, I would like to proclaim the Sabbath in Scripture throughout its epochs. Now, unlike a good Baptist, but like a good Calvinist, I have five points this morning. The Sabbath modeled, the Sabbath commanded, the Sabbath forgotten, the Sabbath changed, and the Sabbath applied. So we will begin with the Sabbath modeled. We will get into our text soon enough, but the story of the Sabbath does not start there. It starts before Moses, before Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, before Noah. It starts before the fall itself. The origins of the Sabbath go all the way back to the seventh day of creation. We read about it in the first verses of Genesis 2. So we can look up Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. On the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. Raises the question, did the omnipotent creator, who is without limit, rest from his work because he was tired? Because he just didn't have it in him to go on without a breather? Of course not. The reason he rested was to give us a model. Adam was there. Presumably the effect was not lost on him. He is to work for six days, and then comes a day of rest. Now, if, if this was true before the fall, before the ground was cursed so that blood and sweat would be required to rest food from the soil, how much more would such rest be required after? the fall. So thousands of years pass. God makes a covenant 
with Abraham, and from him come a covenant people. The people are brought out of the land of slavery and prepared to enter the land of promise. For the first time, God lays out his moral law, and he does it in Ten Commandments. Congratulations, we are here. The fourth concerns the Sabbath day. This this is not the first time that they have heard of the Sabbath, mind you. Back in Exodus 16, they are called to observe the Sabbath, and honestly, it, it, it reads as though they already had some familiarity with the Sabbath day, even before that. But let us read it. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Our text this morning says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You are to labor six days and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. You must not do any work. You, your son or daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock, or the resident alien who is within your city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and declared it holy. Now, the Sabbath is is not only talked about here in the law. In fact, it shows up time and time and time again. And for the sake of time we are going to utilize three texts in the law to show what the Sabbath day was to mean to God's old covenant people. Three texts to show what the Sabbath day was to mean to God's old covenant people. First, we'll utilize our text this morning. It shows that the Sabbath was given by God as a call to rest. A call to rest grounding his commandment in the Sabbath model of creation that we've already seen, God commands his people to rest. No work is to be done within Israel on the seventh day of the week. Not even animals are to be put to work. Not even foreigners who happen to be in Israel during the Sabbath are permitted to work. The entire nation is to shut down for one day every week. Activity was to Shabbat, where we get Sabbath from, or or, or cease on the Sabbath day. Secondly, the Sabbath was given as a sign between God and his old covenant people. We see this in Exodus 31, verse 13. Exodus 31, verse 13 says, tell the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths, for it is a a sign between me and you throughout your generations, so that you will know that I am the Lord who consecrates you. Not only did the Sabbath call for rest, it also served as a sign of the ongoing relationship between God and Israel, the covenant between them. And lastly, the Sabbath pointed back to God's redemption. Look at Deuteronomy 5, 15. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. It says, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Remember, the Israelites were in slavery for a very long time. They worked, and no doubt they worked for seven days a week. In the promised land, they could observe the blessed Sabbath rest that they could not under Egyptian slavery. Where they were forced to work constantly under Pharaoh, now under God, they have Sabbath rest. So to summarize, God gave the Sabbath to his old covenant people as a call to rest, as a a sign of the covenant, and as a reminder of his deliverance. We will come back to this again. Yet, 
the people wasted almost no time in ignoring the fourth commandment and the other Sabbath laws. That there are references to weekly Sabbath observance throughout the Old Testament, but mostly it's during the reign of the good kings of Judah, occasionally, peppered in throughout its history. More often than not, the Sabbath was forgotten. Its rest was disregarded, its redemption forgotten, and its sign thought irrelevant. And honestly, the Old Testament is largely a history of God's people ignoring and disobeying God's laws. And they were no different when it came to the Sabbath. In fact, we read in 2 Chronicles that the purpose of the 70-year exile of Israel was in order to give the land the Sabbath rest that Israel had refused to give it. They never allowed the land to rest in accordance with the commandment. For 490 years, every seventh year was to be a year of rest. So if you spend 490 years in the land and you never give it its rest, how many years of rest has the land earned? Seventy. But time and time again, the Jews forgot the law of the Sabbath. However, by the time we hit the intertestamental period, that is, the time in between the Old and New Testaments, we see a very interesting twist. After Israel returns to the, to the land, they become, not immediately, but over time, obsessive about the Sabbath. Where, where previous generations ignored the Sabbath, these Jews made it of utmost importance. That's great, right? They've, they've remembered the Sabbath, so everything is, is, is fine, correct? Not quite. Yes, the Jews have remembered the law of the Sabbath, but they had forgotten its spirit. And this was the situation that Israel found itself in when the Messiah appeared, Jesus Christ. We've already, we've already read one, one conversation between the Pharisees and Jesus. We're about to read another. Jesus intentionally performed many miracles on the Sabbath to bring, it, to bring attention to this. It specifically mentions so many miracles done on the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath day. And there's a reason behind it. Their hearts may have remembered the law of the Sabbath, but they did not remember its spirit. And so a man was made well on the Sabbath, and rather than shouts of joy, the Pharisees are enraged. And what is Jesus' uh, response? Look at John, 17, uh, John 7, verse 23. It says, If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses won't be broken, are you angry at me because I made a man entirely well on the Sabbath? Think of the heart. To, to forget the spirit of the Sabbath is just as wicked as to forget its law. It is. Now, this provides us actually a, a pretty good bridge here. Um, I, I have made it a point time and time again, to refer to Israel, not just as, as Israel, but as God's old covenant people. Multiple times, God's old covenant people. Well, what does that have to do with us? What, what about the new covenant? What is the relationship between the, the Sabbath day, as we have seen so far, and the new covenant? And we will now turn to a passage to see the transformation between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. However, the text that we are going to look at is not in the New Covenant, uh, and is not in the New Testament, but rather the Old Testament, prophesying about the New Covenant Sabbath. I thought this was a, a fantastic... Um, uh, uh, I had never ever thought about, about this, this text talking about the Sabbath. So if you can turn with me in your Bibles, preferably not just the screen, but 
in your physical Bible or your phone or something like that, turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56, 1 through 8. And as you're turning there, let me say a couple things about where we are in this book. Um, the book of Isaiah is separated into sections, and it is widely acknowledged that Isaiah chapters 40 through 66 is pointing forward to the new covenant. In fact, it is in these chapters that we read about God's suffering servant, who is pierced for our transgressions, by whose wounds we are healed. It is in these chapters that we read about a new heavens and a new earth, long before the more detailed preview in John's revelation. And in Isaiah 56, verses 1 through 8, we read about the new covenant, but in very interesting language. So, Isaiah 56 says, This is what the Lord says. Preserve justice and do what is right. For my salvation is coming soon, and my righteousness will be revealed. Happy is the person who does this, the Son of Man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. No foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord should say, The Lord will exclude me from his people. And the eunuch should not say, Look, I am a dried-up tree, for the Lord says this. For the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold firmly to my covenant, I will give them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give, them an I will give each of them an everlasting name that will never be cut off. As for the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to become his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and hold firmly to my covenant, I will bring them to my holy mountain, and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. This is the declaration of the Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel. I will gather to them still others besides those already gathered. And what we read in this passage is a description of the new covenant. But it is seen in language familiar to those to whom, to whom Isaiah was writing. Israel knew who the people of God were. They knew what the house of God was. They were familiar with burnt sacrifices and, and the altar. They knew of the Sabbath, whether they observed it or not. And so what Isaiah is doing here is he is taking all of these things that they were familiar with and expressing new covenant truths through them. So let's take a look at this, because I don't want to just say this and be like, there you go. We, like, this is the sort of text that we need to look through to see, you know, is this actually a correct interpretation? Um, so first off, the people of God. And I think this is probably the strongest one. Under the Old Covenant, the people of God, in the main, were those who were descendants of Abraham. There were some others from other nations, but that was not common. The right to being one of God's people meant, for the most part, being Abraham's biological offspring through Isaac and Jacob. But what do we see here? Foreigners who love the Lord, will be brought to his holy mountain. And while technically that could have happened under the Old Covenant, the fact that it is mentioned suggests that Gentiles may play a larger role in the new. But more important is that eunuchs are mentioned. We usually don't ever think of eunuchs, just, just being honest. We don't. And 
I would bring up a uh, particular verse, uh, but due to the um, graphic description in it, I'm just going to reference Deuteronomy 23, verse 1, which clearly says that eunuchs are barred from ever entering the Lord's assembly. Ever. Yet here, we see that eunuchs are not to be considered as separated from God's assembly. And Isaiah goes out of his way to say that the name that these faithful eunuchs will be given will be in God's house and within God's walls. There is a change between the relationship of the Gentile and the eunuch under the old covenant and their relationship under the, cove- uh, under the coming new covenant. I mean, we see this in Acts Uh, in the book of Acts, right? The Ethiopian eunuch. What will keep me from being baptized? Nothing. Nothing. You are permitted to enter the Lord's assembly not because of your biology, not because of anything else, but your faith. Your faith. Second, the house of God is mentioned. Under the old covenant, God's house was a particular building in a particular geographic location, which means that if you were not in Israel, you were not in God's house. This passage speaks of God's house as being a house of prayer for who? For all nations. Something is changing here, and, and... And look at Ephesians 2.19. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. The word there isn't even for a household. It is just house. God's house under the new covenant is the universal church found everywhere throughout the world. We are God's temple. Third, burnt sacrifices and the altar are mentioned. In the New Covenant, as we are very much aware, there are no more animal sacrifices. There was the sacrifice of Christ once and for all, and our high priest is set down at the right hand of the Most High because atonement has been accomplished. But this text still talks about sacrifices. What then could Isaiah be referring to? Allow me to direct your attention to Romans 12, verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1. Paul's letter to the Romans says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. So yes, we are still called to sacrifice under the new covenant. But they are sacrifices not for our justification, but our sanctification and our our, our being used of God. We are, like Paul, being poured out as a drink offering. We are fighting the good fight. We are finishing the race. We are keeping the faith. And so, seeing the people of God in this text transformed under the new covenant, seeing the house of God transformed under the new covenant, and seeing sacrifices and offering transformed under the new covenant, we now come to the Sabbath. When all of these things are present in the new covenant, in a transformed manner, what does this say about the Sabbath? The Sabbath will continue under the new covenant, but it will be transformed. 
It, it will not look the same. Uh, Richard Barcellus, this book, this is, he had, he goes into much more detail of that text than I do. So I highly recommend this text if you have any, uh, if you have any questions or, or whatever about Isaiah 56. Just kind of blew my mind. Um, his, his work has been absolutely instrumental to my understanding of the change of the Sabbath. Uh, he says this in, in this book, the Old Testament prophecies a sa- or prophesies whatever a Sabbath for the inaugurated New Covenant era, while at the same time announcing the end of Old Covenant Sabbaths. According to the New Test, uh, according to the Old Testament, when the old Sabbaths go, a Sabbath yet abides. Thus, a new Sabbath must be instituted. So, let's go to that new Sabbath. Unfortunately, I. I wish I could go into more detail in this text, but uh, it just, it, it is beyond me to, to, to preach that in five minutes. So um, Hebrews chapter four, verse nine says very succinctly, therefore, Hebrews four, nine, therefore a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. The only thing I'll say, I'm, I'm kind of going off here. The only thing that I will say about that is that the word for Sabbath rest is sabbatismas. It is not the typical word for rest. If you happen to be in your Bibles in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 right now, you will see multiple references to the word rest. That's a completely different word. In fact, the word used here for Sabbath rest this is the only time it ever appears in the entire New Testament. And all of the, all of the other times that it's ever used in, um, in uh, uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament or other, other um, works, it always, always, always refers to an active rest. Not like a state of being like, like we are in God's rest, like we see earlier in the chapter, but an actual rest. A Sabbath rest remains for God's people. So if such a, re- if such a rest remains, where is it found in the New Testament? I feel like this is something that we're, we probably already know where I'm going with this. Is there any day that appears to have special significance? Is there any day in that, that his new covenant people met in the New Testament in ways similar to Sabbath synagogue worship? Acts 20, verse 7. Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, we assembled to break bread. Paul spoke to them, and since he was about to depart the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. So in this text... We see a meeting of believers on the first day of the week. This includes Paul speaking, likely preaching, especially since it goes on till, till midnight. One person speaking until midnight. If it's Paul, you can bet that that was a sermon. Um, and quite possibly the observance of the Lord's Supper when it refers to breaking bread. Secondly, 1 Corinthians 16 Verse 2. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. On the first day of the week, each of you is to set something aside and save in keeping with how he is prospering so that no collections will need to be made when I come. So here we see the meeting of believers, but unlike the first one, this is not a description of a one-time event. This is Paul prescribing behavior to believers. You are to set something aside on the first day of the week. That strongly implies that they are meeting on the first day of the week. And the way it is written suggests that Paul is not telling people to start meeting on the first day of the week, but to start collecting during their already existing meetings from the first day of the week. I can't see how they couldn't be meeting if there was them to, to start setting aside, you know, like in their house or something. Why does it matter what day of the week 
they set something, like they, like they move gold and silver coins from one part of, part of their house to the other. What does it matter what day of the week? But if they were already planning on meeting on the first day of the week, of course you would gather it all into one big pot. We move forward a couple of decades, and this practice of meeting on the first day of the week continues, but apparently it has been given a new name that John uses. Revelation 1.10 Revelation 1.10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud, vow, uh, lo a loud voice behind me like a trumpet. Now, he doesn't coin the phrase here, but he writes as though he's expecting his readers to know what he means when he says, Lord's day. The seventh day rest of the Old Testament is gone. But, the, but in its place is the first day rest of the New Testament, in the Lord's day. So now we come to the Sabbath applied at 11.43 a.m. Unfortunately, <clears throat> I cannot give you a list of rules, nor, to be honest, would I even if I had time. Um, John Owen brilliantly remarked, I love this, this, this phrase, a man can scarcely in six days read over all uh, the duties that are proposed to be observed on the seventh. Because people, they love to make lists of rules. You can't do this on the Sabbath. You have to do this on the Sabbath. Much <clears throat> Much ink has been wasted on trying to hammer out universal rules for the new covenant Sabbath. Instead, I will simply draw principles from the old covenant Sabbath and explain their function under the new covenant. So we saw earlier that the Sabbath was meant as what? A call to rest, a sign of the covenant and a pointer to redemption. And so in different ways, these three still function. So we'll look at all three of them. First, the Sabbath is a call to rest. Jesus tells us about the relationship between man and the Sabbath in Mark 2.27. Mark, <clears throat> Mark 2.27 says, Then he, meaning Jesus, told them, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Now, we focus often on the fact that man was not made for the Sabbath, right? We, we don't have to do all this stuff, all these rules, you know. I mean, the list of rules that existed during Jesus' time for the Sabbath was just literally insane. And I mean that with every fiber. Like, just to give you an example... You could not write two letters on the Sabbath. You could write one letter on a wall. That's fine. But if you write two letters on a wall, it's a sin. You could write one letter on that wall and one letter on that wall, and it's okay but you could not write one letter on this wall and one letter on that wall because they are next to each other, so it is like you are writing two letters on one wall. Therefore, it is a sin. When I say insane, I am not joking here, folks. Again, we often focus on the fact that man was not made for the Sabbath, but we forget the first part. The Sabbath was made for man. If God has provided the Sabbath for man, that means that there is some lack in man that the Sabbath was designed to satisfy. And I could convince you, but I don't need to. Life is tiring. 
It doesn't matter if you are a farmer or you do data entry. We are not made to work seven days a week. I know, mul uh, I know people who have multiple jobs and they never have a day off. It is not healthy. I think, I think we all inherently recognize that it is not healthy to work every single day. We need regular periods of rest. And the Sabbath day, whether the seventh day under the Old Covenant or the first day under the New, that is given to us to provide rest so that we may work more efficiently. I don't know of anyone who says, after, like, like human composition changed after the New Covenant was instituted and now people don't need rest anymore. No, we still need rest. And the Sabbath is a call to rest. Now, specific actions forbidden on the Lord's Day are not given in the New Testament, and so I'm just not going to speak on those. What I will do is I will trust that as the Spirit works in you, he will bring to mind particular actions he would encourage or, di or discourage you from engaging in. Secondly, we'll go to the third one. As the Sabbath day pointed to God's redemption of Israel from Egypt, so the Lord's day, occurring on the same day of the week as the resurrection of Jesus, points to God's redemption of true Israel from our sin. Now here's a, a long quote that I'm not sure ended up making it to the uh, PowerPoint, but oh well. Um, Sam Waldron says it better than I ever could. It says, the New Testament teaches, therefore, it's on there. The New Testament teaches, therefore, that there is a new creation in Christ. The idea of a new creation is frequently associated with Christ's resurrection. By union with Christ in his death, the old man is destroyed. By union with Christ in his resurrection, the new man is created. When he rose again, he became the firstborn of God's new creation. As he was the beginning of the old creation, so he is now the beginning of the new. Thus, the memorial of Christ's resurrection is of necessity a memorial of the new creation. Thus, the Lord's day, like the Sabbath, and unlike any other religious observance, points to both creation and redemption. So as you observe the Sabbath, remember your redemption. Remember that you were once enslaved to sin and were by nature children under wrath, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. Church, remember every Sabbath day, every Lord's day, that you are saved by grace. And finally, the purpose of the Old Covenant Sabbath was that it was a sign of the covenant. Now, the Lord's Day is never called a sign of the New Covenant. However, it could be called a backdrop for the sign of the covenant. The physical signs of the New Covenant are the initial sign of baptism and the ongoing sign of the Lord's Supper. Baptism throughout the majority of church history has occurred within the corporate gathering of the Lord's Day. The Lord's Supper seems in the New Testament to have been observed when the church meets, according to 1 Corinthians 11. And no other time is the post-temple church said to gather except on the first day of the week. From this, we can infer that the Lord's Day while not itself a sign of the covenant, serves as the backdrop for the new covenant signs. And with that in mind, we turn to observe the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day.